It's the twin turbo all wheel drive Titan from Japan that turned the world on its head. It came, it saw, it conquered, then it did it again five more times. I've said it before and I'm gonna say it again. Donut might not exist without this car. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Nissan Skyline GTR. Wait, you already did this. It was your first episode. Yeah, but it was like five minutes long and the coloring was really bad and we didn't even have a microphone or any lights. And honestly, you know what? Give me a minute. Oh, uh, sure, yeah, take your time. I'll be here. <laughs> July 2017. July 2017. July 2017. That's Godzilla. It wasn't available to most of us for decades, but it's an icon around the world. How's that? How do you run this? I like this. An evergreen star of video games and movies, the Nissan Skyline is the quintessence of forbidden fruit. This is everything you need to know. One hundred episodes of Up to Speed. Thank you so much for watching and helping us grow faster and harder than we ever thought that we would. The GTR is such a special car to so many people that it only makes sense that we cover it again for episode 100, the way we should have from the beginning. The first Nissan Skyline GTR debuted in 1969. The brainchild of Nissan company man Shinichiro Sakurai, born in Yokohama in 1929. Shinichiro was a no-nonsense man who expected the best from all of his employees. He was known to train freshman engineers by making them practice tracing lines from morning till quitting time for weeks. His reason was that if a designer who was trained in technical drawings did not see the point of drawing simple lines and gave up, they should not be designing cars. Sakurai's son had visited Europe and was inspired by the Formula One racers he saw in person. After getting back to Japan, the Prince Motor Company put him in charge of building a racing car for the company. This led to the GTR's predecessor, the Skyline 2000 GT. Being a perfectionist, he knew it could be better. So in 69A, they dropped the GTR. The GTR was a handsome looking four-door sedan with Sakurai had taken a detuned two liter straight six from the Prince R380 race car and stuffed it under the hood of the Skyline sedan. The Prince R380 was sort of like Japan's version of the GT40, but instead of being designed to beat Ferrari at Le Mans, it was designed to beat Porsche in the Japan Grand Prix. It was a big deal for Nissan. It was a big deal for Japan to put that winning engine in a passenger car. Keep in mind that sports sedans like this really didn't exist back then. Unless you count the muscle cars that were at their peak in America at the time, but those couldn't really handle. The GTR on the other hand, well it could. <laughs> With 160 buff as can be horses and semi-trailing arm suspension, the Skyline GTR was an absolute maniac on the track. It racked up 49 dubs. It also earned itself a cute little nickname. It was Boxy or Hako in Japanese. It was a Suka or Skyline in Japanese. Hako Suka. Hako Suka! <laughs> With so many wins right out the gate, Sukurai's son knew he found a winning formula. Little car, big engine, can't lose. The 1971 GTR Coupe had a shorter wheelbase and was wider than the previous model and looked more aggro too. Shorter and more aggressive looking? Sounds like my brother Lars. The coupe also came with wider tires and a real spoiler. There was no mistake, this Nissan was a true sports car. Shinichiro overhauled the GTR entirely in 1972, this time adopting some muscle car fastback full of vor. Thanks to a strange marketing campaign featuring two fun-loving kids named Mary and Ken. This is Ken and Mary's Skyline. 
This GTR is often referred to as the Ken Mary. Unlike the previous cars, this GTR was not available in four door form. Just so everybody knows, the Skylines at the time were available with four doors, just not the GTR. Even though it looked like a muscle car designed by the Ram Chargers, Ram Chargers. The Ken Mary sure didn't drive like one. It was available with front and rear disc brakes, which was pretty uncommon for the time. Unfortunately, Nissan was only able to pump out 197 of these pups because of a little thing called the gas crisis. Then, in 1984, Sakurai Sun had fallen ill and was unable to complete the design of the next generation Skyline. He gave the assignment to the only man he trusted with the task, an engineer named Nagamori Ito. Ito-san had been a student of Shinichiro for years and was ready to do his mentor proud. The next Skyline, the R31, was slated for release in 1985, 10 years before Post Malone was born. Coincidence? There's no such thing as coincidence. Hi -ya! Sakurai Sun was a legendary figure in the Japanese auto industry at this point. A man who was known to call the Skyline his alter ego and, Na and Naginori. And Naginori had to finish designing his successor while his boss was in the hospital. What was a young man to do? The R31 dropped in 85 to lukewarm reception. Skyline diehards are a tough crowd to please, and this new car just didn't do it for them. There wasn't even a GTR model. This is not to say that there weren't sick R31s. There was the GTSR Group A car and the freaking Skyline Turbo C, freaking sick. Anyway, back to the story. Feeling that he had shamed himself and brought dishonor to his mentor, Ito-san went back to the drawing board and got working on a true successor to the cars that Sakurai-san had made a worldwide phenomenon. <laughs> phenomenon. The next GTR would be designed with one objective in mind in two phases. Dominate the Japanese Touring Car Championship Group A division, then take over the world. The new engine would also be turbocharged, but also had a larger stroke than the previous RB25. They called it the RB26 DETT. Welcome to the world, you legend, you. Ito-san and the team dreamed up a new body to tuck this new engine under. The new and improved R32 GTR was a sporty but understated looking new goop. When they married the new chassis and the new drivetrain together, something new and amazing happened. The new car was a new level of new good. They called it great. Starting in 1989, the R32 GTR race car was entered into the Japanese Touring Car Championships Group A, the series it was designed to dominate. A member? So how'd it go? Out of all 29 races it entered, the R32. Yeah. One. Uh-huh. Every. Okay. Single. Go on. One of them. Whoa! No way! I know, you know that blue Calsana car from Gran Turismo 4? It won both the 1990 and 1994 JTCC Championship, cementing it as the most famous R32 of all race cars. In 1990, the R32 went over to the Nürburgring and ran in the 24 hour race and won. It went to Spa and won there. It went to McCall and you guessed it, it won there too. But the R32's most impactful victories were still yet to come. Gibson Motorsport was a private racing team based in Australia and specialized in Group A and Group C Nissans. In 1990, Gibson got their hands on a Nismo tuned R32 race car. Unnecessary parts like the air conditioning, anti lock brakes, and rear windshield wiper were taken off. Homologation rules mandated that Nissan built 500 of these things for sale to the public. Gibson was used to building the rear wheel drive R31 Skyline and found that parts for the new all wheel drive car would be way more expensive during the build process. Gibson racked up a tab of over $1 million with Nissan. That's slightly less than I make 
for every episode of this show. And they couldn't afford to do that every season, so Gibson decided they would just build Nissan parts themselves. By the end of their run with the GTR a few years later, only the body, front and rear cross members, and the engine block were built by Nissan. Gibson built everything else. They also built the sickest guitars. Gibson Motorsport and the Nissan GTR won the ATCC Group A Championship in 1990, 1991, and 1992. The absolutely crushing victories earned a nickname for those monstrous Nissans. They were titans from the land of the rising sun who smashed anything in their path. From then on, the GTR would be known as Godzilla. The GTR achieved its last victory in Australia in the 1992 2E1000 at Bathurst. After a controversial red flag finish, the bright red Winfield R32 sat in the winner's circle for the last time. People were getting tired of seeing Nissan's win all the time. So for the 1993 season, the ATCC changed its rules heavily favoring the V8 powered Fords. Regardless, Naganori Ito, his team, and Gibson Motorsport had achieved Nissan's goal of reclaiming the performance throne. The R32 GTR was a great car, no doubt, but at this point in the story, it shouldn't be a surprise that Nissan wanted the GTR to be even better. The GTR team was now led by Kozo Watanabe. Yo, there wasn't a better man for the job. Remember that Japanese Grand Prix back in the 60s? Well, a young Kozo was at the very first one and saw that old prince get defeated by the British and Italian race cars. It was literally his destiny to lead the GTR team. It is my destiny to lead the GTR team. While testing the R33 prototype at the Nürburgring, engineer and test driver Hiroyoshi Kato welded brace bars underneath the car to harden the dang thing up. The bodywork was also much smoother, looking downright slippery in comparison to the R32's relatively boxy presence. The R33's wheelbase was four inches longer and an inch wider than the previous gen. Turns out, the longer wheelbase was a good thing. The R33 was more stable at high speed and the reworked aerodynamics reduced lift in the front by nearly half. <laughs> the new GTR had a redesigned all-wheel drive system that could better split the torque between all four wheels, which all but solved the understeer problem of the previous car. The rear wheel steering system was also upgraded with electric servos, which could be adjusted on the fly faster and more accurately than the old hydraulic system. A lot of people think the R33 is a facelifted R32, but <laughs> that's not the case. <laughs> the R33 was 20 seconds faster than the R32 around the Nürburgring, with a time of seven minutes, 59 seconds, making it the first sport coupe to go around that track in under eight minutes. There were tons of special edition R33 GTRs. There was the super limited Midnight Purple option, supposedly named for the infamous Midnight Club Street Racing Syndicate. Then there was the Spec B, which featured stiffer suspension and an active rear differential, which locked under acceleration and opened up when off the gas, making sharp turns easier. Then there was the Le Mans, or LM, which had its all-wheel drive system removed and a more powerful 400 horsepower engine. They only made three of these things. Two were race cars that competed in GT1 racing and one road car which now lives in Nissan headquarters, AKA my house. Confusingly, the next special edition was the Nismo LM Limited, which was not the LM. The LM Limited was built in celebration of Nissan entering the LM edition cars at Le Mans. The LM Limited had special blue paint, carbon rear spoiler, cooling ducts, and some commemorative decals. They also made some V-Spec LM Limiteds. And I'm officially getting dizzy. The coolest R33 of all was the GTR 400R. R is for racing. 
Instead of the RB26, like all the rest of the GTRs, this special edition had a custom RB bored and stroked out to make. Are you serious, dude? Nah, come on, it's hot in the episode. Yeah, dude, go ahead. More power, baby! Yeah! Do it with me! More power, baby! Everybody! More power, baby! How much more power? 400 hertz per, yes! The 400R had a zero to 60 of four seconds and a top speed of 180 miles per. Hot damn! Nissan planned on making 100 of these bad boys, but only ended up making 44, making them super duper pooper rare. The R33 is the dark horse of the GTR line. It's definitely bigger than the others, like Nolan, who's a thick boy, and not as popular, also like Nolan, but Let's give it time and I think both of them will come into their own. No one wrote this. <laughs> However, Watanabe heard people's criticism, heard they wanted more, so they would get more. Just like the leap from R32 to R33, a major improvement for the R34 was aerodynamics. This car wasn't sleek like last time. The R34 is a blocky boy with angular cuts and aggressive features like a stealth bomber. Small divots on the fenders direct air around the front wheels, pulling warm air out from the engine bay and cooling the brakes as much as 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 50 degrees centigrade. The air evacuation and new reworked front splitter work together to give the front end a lift coefficient of 0 0.1, which is basically nothing. <laughs> Under the hood, the turbo got a new ball bearing ceramic turbine, which decreased spool time and increased reliability. The R34's engine also had more aggressive can shafts, even more power, baby. The new GTR was fitted with a six speed get track transmission. The all wheel drive was better. The rear wheel steering was better. Everything was better. And the special editions added even more better on top of that. There was the V-Spec, the V-Spec N1, V-Spec 2, V-Spec 2 NUR, V-Spec 2 N1, M-Spec and M-Spec NUR. And don't even get me started on the race cars. The R34 was a distillation of everything that made a GTR a GTR. <laughs> so, in 2001, Nissan unveiled the GTR concept. Unlike the previous GTR models, this car would not be a souped up Skyline, but its own thing entirely. The design team for this concept was led by Hiroshi Hazagawa, who had worked on the Sylvia S13, S14, and the R34. The concept square shape and broad wheel arches were penned to look like the shoulders of a friggin' samurai. The taillights are definitely GTR. The only major deviation from the design, if you think about it, were the headlights, which had a modern, more vertical, Z-like look. The new GTR, or R35, hit the market in 2000. No longer was the GTR powered by the RB26. It had done its task well, but it was time for something different, something new. The VR38 DETT is an all aluminum twin turbocharged V6. Every engine is assembled by hand in a clean room and only the most experienced Nissan mechanics are allowed to work there. There's only four guys with 100 years of combined experience between them building the engines for every GTR and they deserve recognition. I apologize if I butcher your name. Tsunemi Oyama, Nobumitsu Gozu, Izumi Shioya, and Takumi Kurosawa. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for building this engine for us to enjoy. The VR38 initially made 480 Hersperers. That wasn't super powerful, but when has the GTR ever been about raw power? I'll give you a hint. Never. The VR was hooked up to an updated version of Nissan's Atezza system that prioritizes rear grip this time around. The combination of power and truly unbelievable all-wheel drive grip made the GTR one of the hardest launching cars in history, achieving zero to 60 in a lightning fast 3.2 seconds. Performance like that made the GTR a YouTube mainstay with thousands of videos showing off cars at blistering speed. <laughs>
People say that it drives like a video game, like that's a negative. The only reason we know about GTRs is because of Gran Turismo. So of course, the R35 drives like a video game. And of course, there were special editions and racing versions, like the 2008 Nismo GT500. This car was so dominant that the Super GT League weighed it down with 100 kilogram ballast, and it still won the 2008 championship. It was the first car to achieve a championship with a weight penalty in a decade. The last team to do that was the Pennzoil team in 98 behind the wheel of a bright yellow R34 GTR. 100 episodes. <laughs> Dude, like I didn't think I'd live this long. <laughs> I wanna thank Colby for putting up with all my crazy demands and never missing a deadline uh, and also developing the entire style of this show visually. Rogoff, for making the animations. All the other super hardworking editors here at Donut. I wanna thank Nolan. Uh, f it, like, pause the thing. <laughs> 100 episodes. That's a century. Jesse, you're my partner. <laughs> like, uh, I met you and my life changed. Eddie, you did the first one, you did the first few. Nolan, you evolved this whole thing with me. You're my protege, I love you. I'm so proud of you. I've never been more proud of anyone in my life. Felipe, <laughs> you're a champ. Everyone at Donut, I love you, Matt. Thank you so much for making me do this. And thank you guys for watching this I can't, like, thank you for watching this This is absurd. Holler. <laughs> Follow me on Instagram at James Pumphrey. <laughs> <laughs> Buy my merch at donutmedia.com. Uh, cool, I'm going to Hawaii. <laughs>